Well, first, I'd like to pay tribute to all of you. I think uh, it's really great that you're willing to come together like this and give up time on weekends and at other times in your life to, to do something about climate change. There's too many people out there who are worried about this and aren't taking action. So, yeah, I applaud all of you. Um, a little bit about myself. I Before I was an economist, I was a... Um, evolutionary and conservation biologist. So I come to economics from a science background. Um, I don't put myself into any particular camp in economics, but rather kind of data-driven scientific approach to the study of economics. Um, that's probably enough about me. So carbon thin dividend, I uh, don't want to teach you how to suck eggs, but let's just very briefly say what that is so that we're all on the same page. Uh, it's essentially a carbon tax, although, you know, don't use the T word. Um, that's levied on emissions either at the point of emission or at the um, production of a commodity that's going to result in an emission or, or any way, anywhere along the, the supply chain between those two things. So the distinguishing thing, obviously, about the dividend is the dividend. The carbon fee and dividend is the dividend. And uh, this involves the government collecting the tax, pooling the money, and dividing it up amongst the citizens. Exactly how you divide it up and, and under what ratios, whether that's done on a sort of equivalised household model or just raw amount per citizen is um, you know, a matter for some debate amongst advocates. Um, and we can talk a bit more about that later on, but I think we're better off keeping this conversation kind of high level rather than detail at this point. So the reason, the big reason why as an economist, I like the fee and dividend model is that you can fairly rapidly move to a high carbon price, a relatively high carbon price with minimal economic disruption. Now, obviously we want economic disruption. We want, we want a disruption to the economy that reduces carbon emissions, but we want to do that in a way that's, that's the least harmful, I suppose, both economically and socially. And I think therein lies the strength of the fee and dividend system. So you can have a strong price signal, strong price on carbon that provides a strong incentive to both businesses and consumers to reduce their carbon footprint. But you're still providing consumers with the capacity to continue with business as usual. Now, that might sort of sound contradictory, but there are always going to be industries and individuals and circumstances where actually quickly reducing their carbon uh, footprint is very difficult or impossible. And it, perhaps, we, perhaps we should use an example. So let's talk about petrol. Um, under a carbon fee and dividend model with a significant price signal, petrol is obviously gonna rise. The, the cost of petrol is obviously gonna rise quite steeply. But the dividend allows people to continue driving, to be able to afford to continue driving their same car with their same amount of miles um, because they, you know, they can still afford the petrol price. But, but there's a very strong signal there for them, a strong incentive to either reduce the amount that they drive or to switch to a more efficient vehicle. Now, vehicle, you know, car, the, the car industry has a very slow, long lead time in terms of development of new vehicles uh, and, and the distribution of those vehicles, production distribution. So we're not going to change the car fleet overnight, but the advantage of the dividend is that people can still use the dividend to pay the high fee. This is the key thing that makes the dividend uh, system for carbon pricing really appealing is that where uh, industries either 
don't have, if, if an industry doesn't have a lower emissions option, consumers can still afford those products because of the dividend, but the industry has, still has very strong incentives to do research and development to develop lower emissions um, technologies. And consumers have a very strong incentive to, to find alternative um, products or uh, alternative activities. Uh, and this, by the same token, if there are um, lower emissions products available to industries, the high price signal is obviously a very strong incentive for them for the rapid adoption of those technologies. So it's a it's a sort of cross the spectrum um, incentive with a very high price, combined with the capacity for consumers to continue business as usual, as I said before. So you're going to have the fastest transition that's possible with the minimum, minimum disruption. So while industries are still attempting to reduce emissions in order to save money and attract more um, customers, they won't suffer a massive shock that would occur if you simply were taxing them without the dividend because those consumers have a greater purchasing power to continue, um, you know, supporting those industries. So from a purely economic perspective, that's the, the kind of strongest benefit I see in this model and, and it makes it stand out from any other. But I'm very much a, a political economist rather than a pure economist. I think economics divorced from politics is in many ways a nonsense. Um, so there are also many key, many political benefits from a fee and dividend model. One of them I kind of alluded to right at the beginning, which is that we, we can avoid the T word, the tax word, which, you know, shouldn't be so, but tax is a dirty word in Australian politics and in, in politics in many places. Uh, and the whole carbon tax, uh, narrative and conversation in Australia has become fairly poisoned by um, previous attempts and the successful introduction of the, the last carbon tax. Um, there is the potential for a fee and dividend to have strong bipartisan support. And again, it's the dividend part of the model that, that creates that potential for bipartisan support because the conservative side of politics is, as we all know, um, kind of dominated by those who think that we should minimise the role of government. And the dividend model, uh, by just using the government as an um, intermediary with the money, they collect the money and then they pass it on to the citizens, uh, doesn't increase the size of government, doesn't increase government revenue, and, and spending power. And that definitely appeals to uh, a sort of sub-segment, I suppose, of, of the conservative side of politics. Uh, there's, there's another element in which it appeals to conservative side of politics, which is that there's, there's very little need for direct government intervention in terms of picking winners, as they say, so cho choosing the way in which we reduce our emissions um, or of direct regulation. So, uh, you know, I personally believe that, that that there is a role for regulation and in, a, in an ideal world, we'd be saying no more coal, no more coal-fired power stations, no new mines, setting a timeline for shutting down the current mines, right? That would be my, my personal view that, that there is a role for regulation, but uh, there are certainly many in the conservative side of politics who, who wouldn't agree with that. And that's one of the reasons why this is such an appealing model for that um, sort of political expediency of appealing to both sides. There's another um, potential benefit and that's kind of riding the current wave of popularity of a universal basic income, which is a, it's a very trendy topic and has supporters uh, 
kind of across the political spectrum and the and the social spectrum, I suppose. Um, and there's potential for a fee and dividend system to fund a kind of universal basic income, uh, which in the end becomes a it's a progressive. Uh, kind of tax and benefit system as advocated by the UBI advocates, um, but, but doesn't involve finding the revenue from general revenue or, you know, the, the biggest problem with uh, UBI and, and its critics is that you've got to fund it somehow. So while the carbon fee and dividend system couldn't fund a UBI in the very long term, because clearly we want emissions to fall. And even though we can keep lifting the price of carbon as emissions fall, eventually you've got to reach a point where the amount of money generated from a fee and dividend system falls. So it's, it's an intermediary way potentially of funding a kind of uh, proto universal basic income, which supports artists and the unemployed and all these other reasons why people think a UBI is a good idea. Uh, the system's not without its barriers and challenges. Um, and I think politically, those are, you know, those are mostly fairly obvious, right? We've got, we've got some climate deniers in Australian politics and clearly any action on climate change is, uh, is going to be challenged by the climate deniers. Um, but I think it, it, those aren't really, that, that's not the most significant challenge. The most significant challenge is the, the tainted uh, kind of name that a carbon tax now has and that the, the Labor Party are very scarred by their last experience with the carbon tax and the coalition have to some extent painted themselves into a corner where even models that appear to be in there uh, aligned with their uh, ideology and previous politics are difficult for them to accept because of the past things that they've said. So they have to kind of, in some ways, well, to, to certainly to a, a adopt a trading scheme or a standard carbon tax, they would have to swallow a lot of their past words. Now, as I said before, this, this model allows you to avoid the tax word, but in many ways, it's a, that's a sort of propaganda exercise. It is still a carbon price, it's, and it's similar in some respects to the one we had, where a lot of the money was used to compensate low-income earners. Um, it was revenue neutral, the previous carbon tax we had. But this model, uh, you know, should get around some of those challenges because um, it's not going to general revenue and then being paid back out. But that said, we've got uh, a large hurdle there with the conservative side of politics having railed against, you know, the great big tax. Uh, and, and certainly this could be framed that way as well. Obviously, Big vested interests in, in emitting industries in Australia are, are going to be um, another barrier to any adoption. But I think, to be honest, there's, there's more scope in Australia politically right now um, to fend off those vested interests than there were both at the introduction of the last carbon tax and uh, for the mining resource rent tax, where the vested interests really, you know, they won those debates to a very large extent. I think in Australia at the moment, there's, there's a greater awareness of, of corporate misbehavior and less tolerance for it right now, and less tolerance of corporate influence in politics, more there's a greater focus on it. And that's been building for a couple of years. Uh, so I think, there are reasons to be optimistic about that battle with vested interests. Um, but of course, it's still 
still a huge thing and, they, and they've got an enormous amount of money to spend. And I think perhaps the most interesting thing to talk about in terms of barriers is the equity issues. So it might seem like it's very equitable to uh, have a pool, get a pool of money and divide it out amongst the citizens. And so everyone has the, the same uh, price signal that they're facing. They also have the same amount of money to, to sort of deal with the impact of that price signal. But the reality is that it's, it's often much easier for wealthy individuals to reduce their carbon footprint than it is for poorer individuals. So for instance, if you live <clears throat> in the uh, inner suburbs of our major cities where real estate prices are very high, generally people, you know, relatively high incomes, high wealth live in those areas. There are lots of options for not driving. Just to go back to our driving example, it's, it's relatively easy to jump on the, on the push bike or, or ride or take public transport that's everywhere. But for poorer working class people who generally live in the outer suburbs of our big cities, public transport's often bad. There are little options uh, other than driving, and the same is true for people who live in regional Australia. So I don't, I don't have a clear um, answer or model as to how you deal with that, or whether you even try to deal with that um, equity issue. The same, you know, that there's also there for regional Australia in terms of transport costs for for basically everything. So. The, the heavy transport to bring um, goods to regional Australia will, under this model, become substantially more expensive. And you're not compensating those people who live in regional Australia more than those who live in the cities where the transport costs are relatively low. So these are all things that, are, you know, as an economist and uh, someone who's very interested in uh, social equity issues, we need to think about, and, and it is possible that, that a slightly more complicated implementation uh, of such a, a model would be necessary based on uh, where people live. But the more complicated you make it, the less likely it is to get passed and the, the sort of more such thing can be gamed and, and politically influenced. So my inclination would be to not tinker with the base model if we were to implement a, a fee and dividend, but to potentially advocate at the time for other kinds of compensation in the standard um, taxation system.